Hey everybody, and welcome to another episode of Heartland Heritage. Uh, just been a crazy last couple of weeks uh, dealing with uh, family illnesses and uh, technical difficulties with my uh, computer and software and whatnot. Um, so it's been a little bit of a delay in getting the information out to you that I wanted to in the episodes. Uh, so this episode, we are going to be heading to a place called Kearney, Missouri. Now, Kearney is about 45 minutes north of where uh, Kansas City is. Um, it's a little bitty town. And what is special about uh, Kearney, Missouri, and that would be the James Farm, which I had the uh, privilege of going out to again. It's one of the sites that I've been to since I was a little child. And this James Farm is the home of Frank and Jesse James, legendary outlaws that you see a lot in um, uh, movies, poetry, songs. Um, it's just a, they're very popular, even to this day, um, Bound of Outlaws that uh, people like to uh, apparently write about and uh, make movies of. So I got to go up to this James Farm. Now, uh, on this farm, they have a museum, and it's just their house. The farm, the barn, and everything, of course, has long been gone. Um, but their house, actually, is still in very, very good condition. Um, it's actually pretty slick. Um, it, it's been, I guess, occupied since the 1950s. It's only until just recently that this uh, uh, home actually got uh, emptied out enough for it to be used for tours and for the museum. And so, uh, other things are great about it. It's got the original marker where Jesse James was buried. He was buried originally on the family plot, and then in the early 1900s was moved to the uh, uh, town cemetery, Mount Olivet Cemetery. And uh, that is where he is to this present day. Um, so, it even has uh, even the siding and the siding on the house. It's got the, the more modern siding, but they've actually peeled away a section of the house to show what the house probably, or most likely, except for some alterations, looked like uh, during Jesse James's time there and Frank James. Now, uh, a little bit of information about Frank and Jesse James uh, is kind of what I wanted to blend the the two, the the, the, the James boys and their house kind of together. Thought it was appropriate. Um, Jesse. Woodson James was born September 5th, uh, 1847 in Kearney, Missouri, and his brother Frank, uh, his name was Alexander Franklin James, but everyone, his friends called him Frank James, uh, was born uh, February 18th, uh, 1843. Now, uh, you've probably heard me uh, in a previous uh, episode with the Border Wars uh, talk about uh, the James boys running with the Bushwhackers uh, during right before the Civil War and throughout the Civil War, uh, fighting the Jayhawkers and the Free State of Kansas. Um, so, to kind of give you an idea of what caused the James brothers to be who they were after the Civil War as outlaws and bank robbers, uh, murderers to some, um, heroes to others, uh, Frank was the first of the two to actually go and fight with the Bushwhackers. He was seen to be riding with uh, Captain William Quantrill, and it is rumored, though it's not uh, hardcore evidence, that Frank was with William Quantrill when the Massacre of Lawrence happened. Uh, and then it was a little bit later, as Jesse got older, that he decided to sign up with Captain Bloody Bill Anderson. And Captain Bloody Bill Anderson got the name because of the soldiers he would capture and kill, or civilians that didn't uh, agree with his cause, he scalped and would keep the scalps, hence the name Bloody Bill. Now, interesting enough, Jesse James was originally going to be a minister, and it is the surrounding culture around him that kind of escalated and turned him into what he was. The example being, Kearney, Missouri is actually in Clay County. Now, Clay County, uh, at that time, about 75% of the population either came from southern states or border states, border states like Tennessee and Kentucky that were usually pro-Confederate uh, leniencies. And it was so much so in Clay County, 75%, so much in Clay County, Clay County had a nickname called Little Dixie. So there was a huge amount of pro-South, pro-Confederate sentiment in this area, and that is what Frank and Jesse grew up with. Now, of course, throughout uh, throughout the war, uh, there was, of course, uh, the Union hassling the, the James family, trying to find out where Frank was at. That didn't help Jesse. 
<laughs> like the uh, the Union and the North uh, anymore with them harassing his family. Um, and it's so much so that he eventually went out there and started fighting. So kind of fast forward a little bit. Eventually, the Civil War ends. Of course, the South loses. And Frank and Jesse go back home very disappointed, very angry and bitter, but go home to tend the farm, to become farmers. Now, understand that during that time after the war, it was very hard for anybody who was pro-South. With the rebuilding, especially in Missouri, the border states, Missouri, uh, Kentucky, Tennessee, those border states and the southern states, it was very difficult. It was almost like they were second-class citizens and how they were treated by the winning side, by the Union. So they tried and to become good old citizens, polite, doing what they're supposed to, but it just didn't happen. Eventually, eventually, their old ways started resurfacing. Um, they basically, I think it was uh, December 7th, uh, 1869, with the uh, robbery of the Davis County Savings Association, uh, Savings Bank in Gallatin, Missouri, was kind of the first time really that Jesse and Frank kind of get into that uh, that limelight where everyone kind of pays attention to him. And the reason behind that was there was a gentleman in there that Jesse mis mistook for someone else. His name was Captain John Sheets. He was with the Union during the Civil War, but he had never met Jesse. Jesse had him confused with a guy named Samuel P. Cox, who was also a Union soldier, but he was credited with killing Bloody Bill Anderson during a skirmish in Missouri. Jesse looked to Bloody Bill Anderson kind of like a father figure during the war, so he took that very personal. He mistook uh, the gentleman for Mr. Cox and pulled out his gun and killed him in cold blood right in front of everybody. So that was kind of the big, oh my, here's Jesse James, and the kind of media frenzy started. Um, as far as the media goes, of course, if you were from the North, Jesse James was a horrible person, for the most part. But there was a... a uh, some of the media, especially like the Kansas City Star, there were certain editors in there who were romanticizing him, calling him a hero of the common people. Uh, like I said, kind of made him like a, a Robin Hood of, of the Midwest versus, you know, kind of like how uh, the UK views Robin Hood, you know, steal from the rich, give to the poor, um, you know, fighting the man. <laughs> so, um, so they started making him more glamorized, I think. And I and I don't know, there's there's personal opinions of people saying that would get to Jesse's head. Others said it didn't bother him one bit. But I think he kind of liked the attention. Um, now, he went on to rob banks, rob trains. Uh, there was some people who would get killed uh, during this time, of course. Um, like I said, they were trying to make Jesse James more than he kind of was. They were kind of just making him more... Um, uh, fantastic than he actually was. But there was also things that the Union, uh, or at least people around that dealt with the Union were once Union soldiers or dealt with capitalism um, that were not making things easier. For example, the railroad, that especially the, the people, the railroad companies that Jesse was robbing, was hiring Pinkerton men. Pinkerton men were kind of a, a, a security agency that could be uh, hired to bounty hunt, to find outlaws, whatever. They made, they hired the Pinkerton men to find Frank and Jesse. Now, part of those things where I talked about where they made things worse, uh, the Jesse James house, the farm where we're at, and the actually the one corner of the house that they took the siding off of, where you can see kind of the original, what it looks like, there is a window there. That window is the window where Pinkerton men came one night looking for Frank and Jesse. They didn't verify if Frank and Jesse were actually in that house. So they lobbed a grenade into the and through the window. Now, what they didn't bother to check was uh, Frank and Jesse's mother, Zerelda, was in there, and so was their 10-year-old uh, little brother, uh, Archie, along with his uh, stepfather. Of course, when they and it came in, the father didn't realize it was a grenade, didn't know what it was, and he kicked it into the fireplace which caused a massive explosion. It injured Frank and Jesse's mother to the point where she had to lose an arm, and it killed their little brother, Archie, who was 10 years old. So, of course, that gets into a media frenzy that the Pinkerton men, along with this railroad company, kills women and children. Doesn't look good. Just makes Frank that much more, uh, Frank and Jesse that much more um, supported. And hence, that's one of the reasons that Frank and Jesse were so difficult to find 
throughout their crime is because a lot of Missourians or I guess you would say rural people supported them and would hide them and keep them from being caught. So it made things very difficult for the authorities to find these guys, hence the kind of Robin Hood uh, look or feel to it. Um, now, another turning point that happened. They're at the pinnacle of their, their crime wave or their crime uh, careers. September 7th, 1874, Frank and Jesse are with James, or, uh, Bob and Cole Younger, the Younger Boys, and it was the James Younger Gang, up in uh, Northfield, Minnesota. And they were going to rob the First National Bank, which is actually still around there today. Um, and it was one of those ones that you see, kind of like in the movies, where the whole uh, population are kind of like the police force. And basically, they caught uh, the James Younger Gang completely off guard and killed everybody in that gang was either killed or captured except Frank and Jesse. Frank and Jesse escape, run south, go into hiding. Now Frank by that time has started laying low, trying to get a normal life together. Jesse tries, just can't do it. He's got that rebel itch that he's been never been able to get rid of. So he gets Robert and Charlie Ford, some guys he knew, and builds a new gang. Ironically enough, it was Robert and Charlie Ford who killed Jesse at his home in St. Joseph, Missouri, uh, while he was unarmed and uh, working on a, or going up and adjusting a frame on the wall. Got shot in the back of the head. And that got him killed. Five months after his death, Frank turns himself into the governor of Missouri, uh, actually walks right up into the Capitol and hands his firearm over to the governor and makes sure to let the governor know that no man has ever touched his firearm since 1861. Uh, also, Interestingly enough, Frank is arrested, goes to jail for three weeks, goes to another jail for a year, but is never gone to prison. He becomes uh, basically all the charges have been dropped. He's been acquitted. He never spent one day in actual prison after all that he had been going through with Jesse. So Jesse James dies. Rumors of his survival immediately start surfing that they're seeing him elsewhere, that he faked his death, that the Ford brothers helped him uh, stage his death, and oh, he's really alive, even though they used bullet wounds from witnesses who saw, like friends who knew him, his, his bullet injuries from previous fights, and also uh, one of his middle fingers was missing, and they used that too to identify him. I mean, they were pretty sure, without a shadow of a doubt from other people, that at that time, that was Jesse James. But as time progressed, uh, it started becoming, of course, the legend of Jesse James never died. It just gets better and better and better, and people start claiming that they're Jesse James. Um, a good example is a guy who was named J. Frank Dalton. Uh, he died August 15th in 1951 in Granbury, Texas, but Dalton was allegedly 101 years old at the time he first appeared in May of 1948 claiming, I am Jesse James. Now, of course, they had rel surviving relatives, surviving friends who interviewed him, and in the end decided this is not Jesse James. It's just someone wanted to pretend to be him, whether it's they were infatuated with Jesse James or they just wanted the limelight. But that's one of those examples. And there have been other people in the past claiming to be Jesse James that have been proven out not a problem. But that legend of him faking his death has always lingered, never went away. So in 1995, uh, they went to... Jesse James' grave in Mount Olivet Cemetery in Kearney, Missouri, and exhumed him. And using mitochondrial DNA, along with, uh, from uh, distant relatives, they took samples from the supposed Jesse James' body in the grave, and with one of Jesse James's known uh, cousins, relatives, farther down the line. And it ended up being a match, confirming it. But of course, everyone loves a good fantasy, a good tale. So even after that, there's been rumors and newspaper reports and blog posts and books about how the DNA wasn't handled correctly and it was a conspiracy and it was a cover-up. No matter how much evidence is supporting that this is the body of Jesse James, nope. nope. Even today, Jesse James' wife, they know from history, died in poverty. No money whatsoever. Yet there's this mythical, secretive, treasure trove hoard somewhere in Kansas that is Jesse James's hidden treasure 
and that it's worth you know all kinds of money and people are finding it and they did a document the history channel did a tv show on it a documentary on it um there's been books on it i just somehow have a f problem believing that jesse james would leave his wife who he loved very dearly and his children broke so there's not really a whole lot of evidence concrete evidence suggesting that jesse james had any kind of treasure whatsoever um so that is kind of, in the end, a brief overview of Jesse and Frank James and the James Farm. It's up and set in Kearney, Missouri. If you ever have a chance to come into the Midwest in the state of Missouri, definitely go check it out. It's a nice little area. It's kind of on the outskirts of Kearney. It's very uh, well maintained. You can easily do it in half a day. It's a great tour, great people. Um, the town of Kearney is a great place to go. Just go and check it out. And definitely, and matter of fact, ironically, when I was up there, there was a gentleman from Cork, Ireland, with his wife taking a tour. And the reason he came here, they were on their way to Arizona, uh, the state of Arizona. And they were going there just because they had heard the stories from old, you know, spaghetti Western novels and movies and stuff about Frank and Jesse James. And so they wanted to see this guy, you know, the, learn about him and see where he lived and, and everything. Um, unfortunately, with the videos and the pictures you've seen so far, I wasn't allowed to take pictures inside the museum. That's an unfortunate thing, but it's definitely worth uh, the look. So once again, if you'll ever have a chance, definitely go up there and check out the James Farm Museum. It's definitely uh, well worth the trip. So uh, in the meantime, I am now going to go and start doing my research on my next video or finish my research on my next video on El Dorado, the lost city of gold. And that will be here hopefully here in the next uh, week or so, just as long as nothing unexpected pops up. So uh, until then, you all take care and be safe. Peace.